Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, let's stand for the reading of God's word. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 10 this morning. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of our Lord. So what I'm taking away from Conan and Paige's testimony is Katie can cook swordfish. Um, I remember growing up a series of movies that have continued to the present where at some point along the way um, a certain man gets a message and it says something like this, this is your mission should you choose to accept it. Uh, Mission Impossible has uh, been going for many, many years with many different iterations. He goes on to say that if uh, you or any of your team are caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. Um, We are called to a mission as people of God. Now, thankfully, we don't have a secretary in heaven who will disavow any knowledge of our actions. He actually wants to put himself at the center of what we're called to do. And so when we were creating a mission statement six years ago for the church that God was going to create uh, here at Parks, we put that right in the center of it to say, really, it's not our mission. It's God's mission. That God is on mission to do certain things in us and in our world. And so we said, what are we supposed to do to, uh, in response to God's mission? Well, we're supposed to embrace it. We're supposed to embody it, to live it out. And then we're supposed to extend it to others. And so that's what we're going to talk about these next few weeks is the sense of um, what God's up to and how we respond to it. Today, looking at embracing, knowing and owning God's mission in Jesus for you personally, for me personally. The hope is that, is that if we understand this, we'll see Jesus is more and more precious to me. That I am more desperately in need of him. Uh, a couple of, uh, I guess it was a few months ago now, maybe a year or so ago, Nathan and I were headed to a soccer game um, somewhere south of Nashville. And uh, we were making really, really good time. We were, um, were headed down the road and um, about halfway there, something triggered something in my mind to think, did I put that address in in the right way? And the right address in. And sure enough, we checked it and I had put the wrong address in the GPS. And we'd been going for quite some time. We were making really good time. I was driving really confidently, all in the wrong direction. And so it was, it was every minute was getting more and more further from where I wanted to be. Even though I was confident and I was making good time. What Ephesians 2 uh, tells us as we come to it this morning is that that is the state of everybody in the world unless God intervenes. That since Genesis 3, since we as the, our, our best and most perfect human representatives rebelled against God on our behalf, the whole of humanity has been driving. We've been making really good time. And we've been confidently going in the wrong direction, getting further and further from God. 
And so when we come to Ephesians 2, that's what it says. It says you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of, of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. By nature, children of wrath, like everybody else, like the rest of mankind. It tells us there's three things. We were dead, we were enslaved, we were condemned. And it packs each one of those. It says you were dead in what? In trespasses and sins. A trespass is just crossing a boundary that you're not supposed to cross. That's why you see signs up on farms. No trespassing allowed. Don't cross this boundary or you're going to be on the wrong property and there will be consequences. So it talks about sins of commission, things that we've done that we're not supposed to do. That are the wrong way or leading us in the wrong direction. And sins, which sins is the other side of that. It's falling short of a standard that you were supposed to live up to. That you were designed for, that you were made for. Sins of omission. Not just committing something, crossing a boundary, but not living up to, not doing what God has for us and called to us. And that has ended in us being in a spiritually dead state. Not sick. Many of us have gotten sick this season. We know what it's like to be sick. And at times we may have said, am I going to die from this, whatever the sickness is. Sometimes you feel like it. But there's a difference between being sick and dead. And the Bible says you're not just sick. It's not that you're just ill with this disease of sin. You are dead. You are unable to do anything about it. And then it says not only you're dead, you're enslaved. It goes on and it talks about we were following the course of the world. That if we're to left ourselves, we naturally follow that course. And it makes us captive to the evil one. And what he would have for us to, to go away from God. To be centered on self. To think the world revolves around us. And to be confined to that small, small world of living for yourself instead of living to and for and in the Lord. You're dead, we're enslaved, and then we're condemned. Because of all of this, we are children of wrath, it says. In other words, God has a settled personal hostility to anything that's evil, to anything that would harm his people or his world, even if it's them. And he's, 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 he's got a, 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 a settled personal hostility to that to the point where he's not going to overlook it. He can't just sweep it under the rug. He's got to deal with it. He's got to do something about it. So, God's mission is and was to do something about this problem. About the fact that we were dead and enslaved and condemned. That we could do nothing to free ourselves. That we're headed in the wrong direction and we're making good time. God had to intervene for us and for the world. And that is where the rest of Ephesians 2 goes. That is the mission that God's on that we are called to embrace. We're to open up our arms and receive it. To apply it to our hearts and our lives and see him change us. So quickly, what we embrace, how we embrace, and where we embrace it. First, what are we embracing? What are we talking about here? We are to embrace union with Christ. That's what Ephesians 2 describes. And, and the rest of the scriptures in so many places talks about this idea of union with Christ. That because of what Jesus has done, the Holy Spirit comes and grabs hold of our hearts and unites us to him. And this is the doctrine, not of Batman, but this is the doctrine of Spider-Man. Remember, Batman is this guy, guy that's got all the bells and whistles on the external. He's got a belt that's got all the tools in it. He's got a suit that makes him strong and makes him able to do different things. He's got all these gadgets, right? And it's all external. But Spider-Man has something happen to him that causes an irreversible, complete change in who he is. He is now a new creation. And because of that, it works itself out in the things that he's able to do and the things that he's called to do and be. He's no longer just Peter Parker. He still looks like Peter Parker. He doesn't lose his identity, but is called up in a greater identity as Spider-Man. That is what union with Christ is. Christianity is not a bunch of externals that we put on, that we just do a bunch of things and act a certain way. It's a change that works itself out from the inside. That's what we're called to embrace. That we have a new position and we have a new power. 
We have a new position in Christ. He, he comes and he wraps his arms around us. He covers us so that when a God who has a settled disposition against anything evil, anything contrary to his will, when he looks at us, he no longer sees us as a rebel. He sees Jesus who's covering us, who we are in. He's done it all. We have something that's true about us positionally that changes everything. And that issues forth a power, not just a position, but a power. Not only are we in Christ, but Christ is in us. So we are to, to walk in that. We have this, not only he has done it, but also now because he's in us, you can do it. We have a power to then follow after him in ways that we would never have been able to do otherwise. Why? Because we were dead. And we were enslaved. And we were condemned. So that's what Ephesians talks about here. It says, yes, you, you, you were dead and you were enslaved and you were condemned. Well, what Jesus has done is he's raised you. He's caused a resurrection from the dead. He's liberated you from slavery. He's rescued you from condemnation. All of those things because he's rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together. Even when we were dead, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that he might do what? Show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus. What we embrace is, is union with Christ, that we are in him, that he is in us. And what that causes us to do and be is a disciple or a follower who learns to embrace two songs playing at the same time. A perfect mashup, right? You know, Ed Sheeran uh, got sued uh, over the last couple of years, right? A couple of times for what? For playing songs, writing songs that sounded very much like previous songs in the world. And you know how he defended himself in court? He pulled out his guitar <laughs> and he played all the different songs that could be played with that chord, those chord progressions. And he seamlessly went from one song to the other in this great medley, this great mashup of all the songs that could be sung to this chord progression, saying, hey, I don't own this, and neither does anybody else. There's a chord progression that you can write all kinds of songs to. Some musicians will correct me when I, after the service of how I just butchered that. But, but what, is it, what, what are we saying? There's, there's two songs playing always in our hearts and our heads and we've got to turn those volumes up on both of those knobs one is this what is true of you this extravagant grace knowing your position in Jesus and the other is what is what to do this radical discipleship this you can now act differently you can now see these things take root in your lives and play themselves out in the real world Ask yourself this morning, maybe jot down, if you're taking notes, maybe jot down which one of those knobs do you need to turn up the volume on. Both of those should be playing at all times in our hearts and our lives. One, God, I don't feel like a son of yours. I feel like a failure. I feel like I'm unable to, to conquer this sin. I don't think I can love this person like you've called me to. What do you need? You need to turn up that volume of what is true of you. You are no longer dead. You are risen from the dead. You're no longer condemned. You are forgiven and loved. You are no longer enslaved. You are free. And then now, not just true of that, but now it moves me to do something about it, to engage, then to step out. Maybe I need to turn up the, the knot. Maybe I've been sitting back, basking in what's true of me, but not actually doing anything about it, carrying it with me into any of the areas of my life. Maybe we need to turn that side of the knob up. Secondly, not just what we embrace, but we see how we embrace. And it's hinted at here, it's, it's, um, it's shouted at in other parts of Scripture, that we embrace through what we call the means of grace. Scripture, prayer, sacraments, community. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, I was reading two different authors, and it said the same thing at different times, in which both of them basically said, hey, we, we wish that you would stop reading our books and give yourself to Jesus in his word. What they were saying is there had been a growth of people that would regurgitate um, God's word in a book or in a podcast or in a blog or whatever it might be, and people were reading those things for their nourishment 
instead of going back to the source, to God's word in itself. And they're like, hey, listen, all these are tools and they're great. There's nothing wrong with them, right? But they never replace God's ordinary means of grace. They never replace his word and his in prayer and the sacraments and community. Those things are where God shows up. They're ordinary in the sense that they're everyday stuff. They're, 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 there's not a lot of obstacles to, to getting to those things. They're not efficient. They're not flashy. But they are supernatural. God's word. Access to conversation with the creator of the universe. Communion. Sitting down at a table. Dining with him and his people. To be nourished by him. The family of God. Those of us who wanderers or strangers now have a family. We just heard about the Hawkins testimony. Those things are supernatural. They're ordinary, but they're supernatural. And they're how we embrace God. It's where God has said, if you go there, I will show up. That is where the living water flows. If you're thirsty, go drink. So in your personal devotion life, in your small group, ask yourself if you're experiencing, if you're um, being intentional about this, this gospel music, this gospel two-step that we've talked about, what is true and what to do, that you are in Christ and Christ is in you, that he has done it and that you can do it. The odds are you're like me in my personal devotion and in my small group. We tend towards one or the other. We tend to focus on either i got to do all these things and we forget about what God has done and the power that comes from him and the dependence and the desperation that we have to depend on him or we talk a lot about the truth of who God is and we never make the steps to intentionally apply it to our lives in any sort of meaningful way we just sit there and because we think we've talked about it we think we've done something instead of taking practical meaningful steps to see it applied to our life what about you in your personal devotion life or in your small group what what needs to what needs to get more intentional airtime in this new year what do you need to be more intentionally focused on turning up and, and participating in? Is it the truth of what God has done? Or is it what he's called you to do? It doesn't have to be either or. Both should be playing. But we tend to focus on one or the other. What we embrace, how we embrace it, and then where, where does this play itself out? I put it this way because I didn't know how to describe it. I, I said it's, it's in our personhood. It's in our humanity means these things play themselves out in our spiritual self, in our emotional, in our social, in our mental, in our physical lives. Every area of our life is touched by these, this truth that God is on mission for you. And he wants to transform and change every area of our lives. Um, it's just like that National Treasure movie I've referenced where at the end he lights the fire and he thinks it's going to be a small little treasure room and the fire keeps going to another room and another room and another room where the treasure is so much grander than he could have ever dreamed possible that's what the gospel is supposed to do the good news of jesus what he's done for us is supposed to shine in every area of our life and see it changed and transformed for him he's supposed to light us on fire in every area of our lives. That's why we talk about, we embrace it where we live, love, and labor. That's trying to be comprehensive. <laughs> it's trying to say where you live, you know, where you do life, whether that's your school or your work or your home or your gym, where do you spend most of your waking hours? And then to think about what are my thoughts in that place? What are, what are my words in that place to those people? What are my habits there? Do they scream of a person that has been radically transformed by Jesus? Am I even considering him when I'm at that place? Am I saying, God, how would you have me engage these people? How would you have me engage this place? Because I'm owned by you, because I'm in you and you are in me. What about where you love? What captures your heart or your thoughts? For many of us, it's, it's sports or it's a cause or it's a group of people, or it's a neighborhood, or a hobby. Maybe it's our, our family, or our spouse, or our friends, these people that, in these places that I love. How has the gospel changed how you 
think and engage in that place that you love. Or where we labor, whether it's our backyard or coaching or in our home with those people or in our place of employment or where I volunteer or my extended family. Where am I giving my labors to on a day-to-day basis? And how might the good news of what Jesus has done for me, how might I embrace it there? Maybe you will not ask a question of in what area of my life do I need to push play on that gospel music, that song of Jesus in my life in this new year. Maybe I've been living out over here, but man, I have kept back this major area of my life. And I need to, I need to shine that light here. What area needs attention? Odds are you know it. Or maybe others have pointed it out to you. Or maybe you need to ask the Lord, which is a scary ask. God, what have I been holding back from you that you want to transform this year? For me, I've mentioned this to some folks earlier in the service. I I was reflecting on this, and I I know some of it's probably seasonal, um, but I've been battling discouragement. Um, And I tend, what I tend to do is I tend to busy myself so I don't have to feel and face it, right? Um, and I need to turn that over to the Lord. I need to let him shine the light. I need to figure out why and where that's coming from, and I need to turn up the volume of who he is and what he's called me to do, to realize the immeasurable riches that I have in Jesus. Let me end with this. We watched, we have a series of Christmas movies that we watch every holiday. We watched the Polar Express again, and In the movie, if you remember it, the main character, um, the kid, he is losing his belief in Christmas magic, right? And so it's represented by one of the sleigh bells. And when he shakes it, he no longer hears the beautiful jingle of the sleigh bell. And so that that theme is traced throughout the whole movie. And he, to his credit, he could act like he hears it. He could play along. Um, but he's determined to find out if it was just something that was a fancy as a kid or whether it's really, really true. And so the gift that Santa Claus get, if you haven't seen the movie, this is on you. It's been out for years, okay? <laughs> the gift that Santa Claus gives him in the end is, is a sleigh bell so that he can shake it and he can hear and remember that music. That, that song of the sleigh bell, uh, and to believe, and to believe. Um, we're going to talk about embodying the mission that God has given us and extending it to our neighborhoods. But if we're just playing along and we don't actually hear that music for ourselves, then it's just going to be white noise. Embod- trying to embody it, trying to extend it, it's going to be like white noise in the commotion and roar of a world that is, is crazy. But man, if, if we hear the jingle of that bell, if we hear that gospel music for us, if we are transformed by it, if it lights us on fire, then it will come through in our relationships with others. It will we'll see impact and transformation on our neighbors, on our coworkers, at our school, at our workplace, all of these places, the idea of seeing these pins up here is hopefully to see and get a picture of, man, if every one of those pins were lit on fire with people who had embraced God's mission for us, how might that change and transform the neighborhoods that we see on this map? Let's pray this morning that God would enable, through His Holy Spirit, us to embrace him and then to see him work through us god thank you thank you for your mission that you did not leave us in our condition of being dead and enslaved and condemned but you brought resurrection and freedom um, and life and forgiveness and we pray that you would help us as we go throughout this year that you would use our small groups and our 
personal devotion time and our time on Sundays, our conversations with our friends from, from church and, and other believers that we know to, um, to turn up the volume on those good news. To us, for us to be able to see and, and be reminded of what you've done for us and then what you've called us to do through your power and in your strength. Help us to more and more embrace your mission where we live, love, and labor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We get to respond to um, the teaching of God's word through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we're going to sing a song that helps us uh, express what we just um, talk, talked about back to God as well. Let me, um, let's use this, these words on the screen to prepare our hearts to respond. Generous God, because you have so freely given to us, we now freely give the offerings of our hearts to you.